We now return to Monday's hearing on the Waco investigation. Last week, a House Joint Subcommittee began eight days of hearings into events in Waco, Texas in the spring of 1993. Witnesses include officials of the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and Treasury Departments. Take your pictures before I sweat. Well, I don't want to destroy anybody's photo opportunity, but the uh, subcommittee will come to order. I think it's time we had an introduction of our second panel. They've arrived at this point, and we're ready to proceed accordingly. If you will recall, a second of this last panel of the day and the last panel of this segment of our hearings will be uh, two of the folks who are the most uh, key features of all of this from the Treasury Department and from the ATF. And they'll be allowed to make opening statements today. I'd like to introduce the second panel. Our first witness is Ron Noble. Under Secretary for Enforcement for the Department of Treasury. This new post, created in 1993, oversees the Treasury's Office of Enforcement, which includes uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms, U.S. Customs, U.S. Secret Service, and the Executive Office of Asset Forfeiture. Before joining the Treasury Department in May 1993, Under Secretary Noble was an associate professor at the New York University School of Law. From 1988 to 1989, he served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General special counsel and chief of staff at the U.S. Justice Department's Criminal Division. Under Secretary Noble began his public service career in Philadelphia, where he was an assistant U.S. attorney from 1984 to 1988. He was sworn in as, tre as Treasury Under Secretary for Enforcement on July 7, 1994. Our second witness on this panel today is John McGall, Director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Farms. Director McGaw is a 34-year veteran of law enforcement, beginning with his career with the Ohio State Patrol. He became a special agent with the U.S. Secret Service in 1967 at Columbus, Ohio. As a special agent, he rose through the ranks in investigative and protective assignments within the Secret Service, serving as head of the Washington Field Office, Deputy Assistant Director for the Office of Protective Research, and Deputy Assistant Director for the Office of Protective Operations. He became Director of the Secret Service in February 1992, and then Director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms in September 1993. I want to welcome both of you here today. I understand, Mr. Noble, you may run over a little bit on your time, but that Mr. McGaw is making up for that. And overall, we're going to have it work out pretty well. So with that in mind, since we are allowing you each to make opening statements, uh, we'll begin. Mr. Noble, uh, well, we've like got a to swear you in first. That's right. We've got to do this under oath. I'm, the, the opening statements I always have to worry about in that regard. If you raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you both. If you'll be seated, I let the record reflect that both uh, answered in the <coughs> affirmative. Mr. Noble, you may begin your testimony. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittees, I have a longer statement that I would like to submit for the record. With your permission. Without objection, it's admitted to the record. I don't believe we have copies of your statement up here. Do we have copies of anybody's statement? I was statement? doing last minute editing, so it should be here shortly. All right, thank you. I speak today in behalf of the brave men and women of ATF. After the failed raid, the deaths of four ATF agents in a tragic fire at Waco, President Clinton directed that Treasury and Justice conduct vigorous and thorough examinations of what had led to the loss of law enforcement and civilian lives. Secretary Benson designated me to lead the Treasury Department's review. He demanded that the investigation be honest, uncompromising, and comprehensive. Secretary Benson appointed three independent reviewers to provide an assessment of the Treasury Department's investigation and report on ATF's investigation of David Koresh and raid of his compound on February 28, 1993. Here's what the independent reviewers said about the Treasury Department's investigation and report in letters submitted to the Secretary in September 1993. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Edwin O. Guthman stated, quote, in appointing the panel of independent reviewers, you said you expected a, quote, thorough, comprehensive, and uncompromising critique. And that, sir, is what has been given to you. It was a privilege to participate in the review, and in so doing, I must say I gained enormous respect for the professionalism and dedication with which the investigative team leaders and their agents conducted themselves at all times. 
Henry Ruth, the former chief Watergate prosecutor, stated, quote, the report insightfully fulfills the purpose of this self-evaluation. The impartiality, integrity, thoroughness, and knowledge of the internal review team members have been evident throughout the five-month intensive investigative process. Mr. Ruth concludes, quote, it's my heartfelt hope that you, Mr. Secretary, as a national leader, can lead the change of orientation, thought, and action so that no more men, women, and children need die in these most difficult of circumstances. Chief Willie Williams of the Los Angeles City Police Department stated, quote, I have found that the investigative team which you assembled is of the highest quality and integrity. These men and women have worked tirelessly to uncover the facts surrounding the events which led up to and included the raid on David Koresh's residence near Waco, Texas on February 28, 1993. The view of the reviewers has been heard and echoed by the Independent Inspector General's Office, members of Congress from Treasury's oversight committees, and major news publications throughout this country. I would ask the committee to include in the record the letters from the three reviewers to Secretary Benson. Objection, Mr. Noble. Thank you. Treasury's Office of the Inspector General determined that the report provides an accurate account of the events. Then Arizona Senator Dennis DeConcini found it thorough, impartial, and self-effacing. Representative Jim Lightfoot of Iowa described the report as thorough in its findings. The Wall Street Journal characterized it as extensively detailed. The Washington Post said it was a thorough and candid account. The Los Angeles Times wrote, quote, despite all that went wrong with the raid by the ATF on the Branch Davidian compound last February, the thorough and complete report released by the Treasury Department shows that much in its aftermath is going right. The New York Times called it brutally detailed. And just last week, Time Magazine stated, quote, perhaps the harshest critic of the ATF's Waco raid was the Bureau's own master, the Treasury Department. In the raid's aftermath, the department launched an investigation by veteran agents from its law enforcement agencies, backed up by independent outside reviewers, including Willie Williams, the Los Angeles police chief. The result was a 500-page indictment that pulled no punches, yet whose details surprisingly went largely unreported. Yet, at these hearings, the very people who are most criticized in the report have baldly asserted that the report is only 70% accurate. Certain members of this committee accepted that figure as gospel without any consideration of the source or evidence to support that number. Indeed, none of those criticized articulated what if any facts in the report were inaccurate, what analysis is flawed. As Secretary Benson observed, it is not surprising that Mr. Serapin, Mr. Hanaski, and Mr. Hartnett disagree with some of the conclusions of the report because they are among those who were criticized and were detrimentally affected as a result of the review's findings. At today's hearing, I have with me almost all of those who worked on the report. They are the finest group of agents and colleagues with whom I have ever been associated. Their dedication, competence, and integrity combine to generate what many consider the finest examination of a law enforcement action ever produced. We stand by our report's facts, analysis, and conclusions, as do our independent reviewers. If the report is only 70% accurate, it's 500 plus pages. If it's 70% accurate, show us the 30% that's inaccurate. Now for the record, I've heard about the 100 plus witnesses that are gonna be called. But for the record, none of the members of the team that generated the Treasury Department's report on Waco were ever interviewed, ever interviewed prior to this hearing to determine what they thought about the report, what they thought about Ron Noble. So let me now ask the agents, lawyers, and individuals who gathered the facts and performed the analysis for the Department of the Treasury's report on ATF's investigation to please stand up and be recognized and identified and associated with this report. Thank you. Every person's name is on this report who worked on it. The masthead, every person's name. Why haven't they been interviewed? Why haven't they been called as witnesses? You accept one person's representation that Ron Noble, lowly Ron Noble, was able to orchestrate a cover-up using career senior special agents from the Secret Service, Customs, IRS CID, IRS inspection, all by myself, 45 plus people, people who made their careers during previous administrations 
The American public has a right to know that one of its major departments, the Treasury Department, already has examined issues confronted by this hearing, and that Treasury's examination was comprehensive, candid, and accurate. By recognizing this fact, these hearings can help to restore confidence in this country's public servants. To ignore or deny the quality of the Treasury Department's self-examination could feed the paranoia and suspicion of a small segment of the American public. Now, what were the major findings? What did the Treasury Department's report find back in September 1993? The Treasury report concluded that ATF, at the request of the local share, properly initiated an investigation into David Koresh and his followers based on information provided by the sheriff. This investigation was predicated on evidence that federal criminal firearms and explosive laws were being violated. It was not based on Koresh's religious beliefs. The Treasury report concluded that there was probable cause to believe that people inside the Branch Davidian compound were manufacturing illegal machine guns and explosive devices, and concluded, as did the magistrate judge who reviewed and approved the warrant, that probable cause existed. No facts have emerged during these hearings that undermine that conclusion. Indeed, after the April 19 fire, the Texas Rangers recovered 48 illegal machine guns, illegal explosive devices, and illegal silencers, and hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition from the compound. Since the Treasury report was issued, 11 Branch Davidians were brought to trial, and eight were convicted of the very firearms offenses that ATF investigated. At that trial, none of the defense lawyers, lawyers challenged the validity of the search warrant. Indeed, I understand that one of those defense lawyers testified last Friday that the warrant was legally sufficient. The Treasury Review Team and the six tactical operations experts all concluded that ATF's raid planning was seriously flawed. We admitted it. We said it. We wanted to save lives in the future. Specifically, almost two years ago, the report concluded that, first, intelligence system flaws, including an improperly conducted undercover operation, seriously compromised the planning for warrant service. Second, because of the flawed intelligence gathering and processing system, the planners did not give sufficient attention to, two, to other options such as trying to arrest Koresh away from the compound. Third, ATF should have consulted with experts in order to better understand Koresh's likely response to different law enforcement op options. Fourth, the planners did not develop a meaningful contingency plan. Despite the flaws in the planning process, four of the re review's five tactical experts who volunteered their time, they were unpaid, concluded that the plan had a reasonable chance of success if all the planner's major factual assumptions had been correct. The Treasury report concluded that, the AT that ATF did not mislead the U.S. military or the Texas National Guard in obtaining assistance. Nevertheless, the review, this report, found that the standards for non-reimbursable military support were unclear and that more precisely defined criteria needed to be developed. Although I have not watched all the testimony, it is my understanding that the military witnesses testified that the assistance provided ATF was legal and appropriate, and none testified that ATF had lied to the military. I also understand that Congressman McCollum, in effect, took the military-related charges off the table in his statement this morning. The Treasury report also found that the Treasury Department in Washington, D.C., did not require sufficient advance notice of significant enforcement operations to exercise meaningfully its oversight of these operations. We didn't say in the report that the investigation began in June 1992 under a previous administration and continued until January 20th, 1993. We didn't say that. We didn't attack a previous Secretary of the Treasury, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. We attacked the institution of the Office of Enforcement for not having the proper rules and guidelines that require bureaus to report highly sensitive or unusual operations. We could have, but we didn't. Nevertheless, even though Maine Treasury didn't find out about it until February 26, two days before the raid happened, on the very day that the World Trade Center bombing occurred, where we had people, we had lives, we had offices there affected by the World Trade Center bombing, what did we do? We didn't know what Waco was, would be. I didn't even know Waco existed, I'm sorry to say that to those of you from Texas. But what did we do on a day when we were worried about the biggest terrorist act in this country's history? Did we do what we could have done? Did we wash our hands of it? Did we say we are not required to give approval? We don't have to give approval. We'll just ignore it. You do what you want to do. We didn't. We inserted ourselves into the process and got assurances 
that if anything didn't look right, the raid wouldn't go forward. Now, I've heard time and time again people mentioning the element of surprise. I want you to look at the section that evaluates the Office of Oversight's role, our role, the Office of Enforcement's role in this book, and tell me where it says element of surprise. And even if it does, a condition precedent to a dynamic entry is surprise. Condition equals element. The report also concluded that the raid should not have gone forward once ATF learned that Koresh knew that ATF was coming 45 minutes in advance of the raid. The report found that the raid commanders failed to appreciate the significance of the information provided by the undercover agent on the morning of the raid and the dangers of proceeding when surprise and Davidian's con conduct were not as planned. The report also stated that the flawed decision to go forward was not solely a question of individual responsibility on the part of the raid planners. It was also the result of serious deficiencies in the intelligence gathering, processing structure, poor planning, and personnel decisions, and a general failure of ATF management to check the momentum of the operation as the circumstances demanded. Moreover, it found that ATF and Treasury bore responsibility for ATF's late notification on the 26th. Both ATF bore responsibility and Treasury bore responsibility. The Treasury Review also uncovered and reported disturbing evidence of misleading statements and of deliberate attempts by the raid commanders Phil Hanaski and Chuck Serapin to shift blame to undercover agent Robert Rodriguez, and you heard more of that today. Finally, the report concluded that ATF agents were brave, they were loyal and disciplined following David Koresh's murderous ambush. They risked their own lives to save one another and to reduce the chance that innocent Davidians would be killed. Now, why do I care about the Treasury Department's report? I feel very strongly about the Treasury report, and I'd like to tell you why. I don't believe a day has passed since February 28, 1993, that I haven't thought about the murders of Conway LeBlu, Todd McKeehan, and Rob Williams, and Steve Willis. I know I was in a position to influence the acting assistant secretary for enforcement not to proceed, permit the raid to proceed. No matter what assurances ATF's then director Steve Higgins gave him, I gave the same advice, first to stop the raid, then to permit it to go forward, that I would have followed had I been the assistant secretary for enforcement. I have never shied away from taking responsibility for my advice then, nor do I now. I was confirmed by the Senate unanimously as Assistant Secretary in 1993 and again unanimously in 1994 as Undersecretary with everything about my involvement on the record. In early March 1993, I attended funerals of three of the four murdered agents. Two were held the same day in different states, so I could only attend three. I do not have the vocabulary to describe the impact of attending the funeral of a law enforcement officer slain in the line of duty. Police officers from throughout the country, state, local, and federal, attend or send flowers in recognition of the unity of law enforcement. Moreover, I felt that the surviving family members gave me more comfort than I gave them. I remember holding Conway LeBlue's son Cameron's hand while I knelt before him. He was 18 months old. I remember Rob Williams' mother holding me in her arms for a long time and telling me that everything would be okay. I remember Steve Willis's father's strength. He said that he was proud of his son because he died doing what made him happy. While I wasn't able to attend Todd McKeon's funeral, I spoke later with a close family member who said, please send me a copy of your report of what happened at Waco before it's made public. I want to know the truth. Three funerals in three states in three days. I'm reminded every day of the dangerous world in which law enforcement operates. Since joining Treasury, I have attended 14 funerals of Treasury agents and employees killed in the line of duty, and eight funerals and memorial services of non-Treasury agents. Before coming to Treasury, the last funeral I'd attended was when I was nine years old. I do not forget that four ATF agents were murdered, three wives were widowed, children are without a father and parents, brothers and sisters are without a loved one. During the Waco funerals, I saw and met ATF agents for whom I would one day be responsible. I saw the bond among them. Men and women cried openly and proudly as they laid their brethren to rest. Black and white agents held each other. Female and male agents held each other. I don't believe that Conway LeBlue had been buried before press reports surfaced that ATF went forward with a raid after learning that Koresh had been tipped to the planned raid on raid day. ATF management did not confirm this fact. It denied it publicly and frequently. 
I committed myself to find the truth using the most comprehensive and authoritative review process possible. And since I don't do the work of the brave and good ATF agents or other Treasury agents who risk their lives each and every day enforcing the law against the country's most dangerous criminals, I committed myself to ensuring that they have the leadership, training, and resources necessary for the work they do. By setting out the truth, the Treasury Department's report honors the memories of the ATF agents killed at Waco. By instituting reforms, Treasury and ATF have worked to ensure that a tragedy of this kind never again occurs. There's been a lot of discussion at these hearings about the need to restore faith in federal law enforcement. I do not believe the American people need their faith restored. They have faith in federal law enforcement. Last week, as these hearings continued, everyday work continued for line agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. That work often places them in the most dangerous neighborhoods pursuing the country's most violent criminals. On the Monday before these hearings began, an undercover ATF agent shot and killed a suspected member of a murderous crack distribution ring in a crime-ridden New Orleans neighborhood who, while pointing a Beretta 9mm semi-automatic pistol, threatened to blow the heads off both the agent and the person in the vehicle with him. The agent, a Waco veteran, was working on a Drug Enforcement Administration task force along with officers from the New Orleans Task Force, excuse me, officers from New Orleans Police and the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office, excuse me. The task force targets violent narcotics offenders. We thus must remember the violent world in which ATF agents operate. When the New Orleans Times Picayune reported on the episode on the front page, it did not mention Waco. The people of New Orleans know that whatever mistakes ATF made two years ago, it carries out a critical, difficult, and dangerous law enforcement mission, fighting violent narcotics offenders and armed career criminals, gangs, illegal gun traffickers, arsonists, and bomb makers. ATF agents daily place their lives on the line to help make our citizens safer. If the American people are reminded of that during these hearings, I believe the mission of law enforcement and ATF will be strengthened as a result. Now, what has changed since the report was released? First, ATF has new leadership. Director Higgins announced his intention to retire before publication of the report and without reading the report. Secretary Benson selected John McGaw, the person seated to my left, then director of the Secret Service, to become the new ATF director. John McGaugh didn't have to do it. He could have stayed at Secret Service, but he cared about Treasury, and he cared about ATF. After issuing the report, Secretary Benson placed five ATF officials on administrative leave, including Mr. Hartnett, Mr. Hanowski, and Mr. Serafin. Mr. Hartnett and Mr. Conroy retired rather than challenge the report's findings. Mr. Troy accepted a demotion in light of the report's findings. Mr. Serafin and Mr. Hanowski were fired because they refused to accept giving up their guns, badges, and ability to enforce federal criminal law. Eventually, they appealed the firing and ultimately agreed to give up their guns, badges, and rank. ATF Director McGaw believed that it was in the best interest of his bureau that ATF settle with them to avoid the possibility that the MSPB would later reinstate them with guns and badges, despite the validity of the report's findings. The second change is that I issued a directive in August 1993 requiring that the Office of Enforcement be informed of any significant operational matters that affect any of the bureau's missions, including major high-risk law enforcement operations. Third, I instituted new guidelines for sensitive undercover operations. ATF, Customs, Secret Service now have all sensitive un undercover operations reviewed by a multi-agency committee to ensure maximum planning and oversight. The multi-agency committee includes not only representatives from all Treasury Enforcement Bureaus, but also representatives from the Department of Justice's Criminal Division. This procedural safeguard shows the increased oversight by Treasury officials over the most sensitive and dangerous law enforcement operations of the bureaus. Indeed, had the undercover guidelines been in place in 1992 and early 1993, the investigation of Koresh would have come under close scrutiny by a sizable group of agents and lawyers from a broad spectrum of enforcement activities. Fourth, we took step steps to improve oversight, including formal and informal communication between Treasury's law enforcement bureaus and Treasury. To that end, I established a weekly meeting between the Undersecretary's office and the heads of each of the Treasury enforcement bureaus and key offices. I also have periodic one-on-one -on -one meetings with each of the bureau heads where policy matters are discussed in greater detail. Of course, I also speak regularly and informally with the bureau heads on both significant and more routine matters. Finally, I reactivated the Treasury Enforcement Council. The tech consists of all the bureau heads. There are also our tech working groups that focus on more specific subject matters. Based on these reforms, an operation contemplated by any Treasury Bureau of the scope and complexity of the Waco raid will come to the attention of a variety of law enforcement authorities as well as my office, well in advance of the planned action. Ordinarily, operational matters are the domain of law enforcement bureau heads. 
The job of the Treasury is to ensure that the bureaus have strong leadership and high standards for personnel, that they institute proper training, are, and are supported with adequate resources and enforce the laws impartially. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Noble. Mr. McGall, we'll now hear your testimony. Chairman McCollum and Chairman Zeliff, members of this. Oh, Mr. McGaw, I'm afraid. Chair Chairman McCollum and Chairman Zeliff and distinguished members of this subcommittee. It's not unusual for me to have to follow Mr. Noble, our distinguished undersecretary, in speaking events, and I know how difficult it is. Um, today, it's even more so. But I am proud to come before you today as the director of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. I emphasize my pride because I know the valuable contribu contributions made by ATF as an agency and the quiet heroics of the men and women of ATF who are dedicated to a simple goal of making our communities safer for all. I emphasize my pride also because I know that the portrayal of ATF as an agency that is out of control is unfair and the demonizing of our employees is slanderous. I feel privileged to lead an agency where in, in the face of unrelenting attacks, agents continue to put their lives on the line every day to protect the American public. And they protect them against the most extremely violent and dangerous criminals in our society. Every day, ATF inspectors and support personnel quietly and efficiently oversee the business compliance uh, through the federal laws that applies to alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, and collect $13 billion yearly in revenue. Make no mistake about it. I take all criticism of ATF to heart. If criticism is fair, I will move vigorously to correct the problem. If criticism is unfair or unfounded, I will defend our Bureau with equal vigor. ATF is no threat to the private ownership of firearms. The law-abiding citizens have no reason to question our agenda. In the area of firearms, our mission is simple, to com combat gun violence. The more successful we are in keeping guns away from criminals and prosecuting those who use guns in crime, the less impetus there is for more gun control. ATF is a neutral regulator. They're neither pro-gun nor anti-gun. The Bureau is tasked with equitably enforcing the laws passed by Congress, implementing the regulations, and collecting those taxes. Unfortunately, there are many who do not trust our motives, their perception that we pose a threat to legitimate firearms ownership could lead to actions by this body and others, as have occurred in the past, that would cripple our crime-fighting efforts. I strongly believe that only the criminal will benefit from weakening of ATF. State and local law enforcement will lose, the victims of gun violence will lose, and even those interested in less gun control will lose. We recognize that Waco has contributed to the current level of mistrust. We are hopeful that these hearings will clear the air and finally disprove the sinister betrayal of ATS, portrayal of ATF's actions. When I came to ATF 22 months ago, I found an agency still mourning the loss of its agents. You saw it here today in the testimony. And still healing its wounds, both literally and figuratively as well as they were experiencing sympathy and pain for the Davidians injured and killed during the Waco incident. I saw it as my responsibility to provide direction, compassion, and leadership, and to see that ATF merged from the Waco experience improved and more effective in carrying out its dangerous law enforcement mission. One thing that I confirmed early was that the image of ATF personnel as sinister agents looking for a fight is utterly at odds with their training, with their character, and with the disposition of the ATF agents I have come to know. In fact, most ATF agents go through their entire career never firing their weapon except in training. 
There is no evil in the hearts and minds of the personnel of ATF. Mistakes are made every day in every field of human endeavor, including law enforcement. We cannot eliminate mistakes, but we can learn to manage and greatly minimize them. In addition to that, we can make sure that there are no mistakes, no mistakes made of the magnitude of Waco. In the aftermath of Waco, we re-examine re completely our way of doing things. We have moved to correct and improve management, training, operational systems, and address the weaknesses identified in the Waco review. We also needed to address operational deficiencies exposed by Waco in order to emerge better prepared to execute our law enforcement responsibilities in the future. To this end, we engaged in a careful self-assessment of what went wrong and why. We have considered the views of our own personnel. We have studied the Treasury review and examined the comments of all the tactical operation experts, as well as those of the independent, independent oversight panel. Today and for the past few days, I have been listening very well to what each of you say in relationship to this event. We have made significant changes in planning, in execution, in post-raid aspects, including improved capabilities in the area of tactical intelligence. Many of you have brought tactical intelligence up in your questioning. Huge errors made there. Any contingency plans, you've talked about those. Operational security, oversight, and liaison. As I said before, no law enforcement operation is risk-free, risk and not all uh, mistakes can be eliminated by systematic changes. The human factor of making very difficult decisions under very stressful times in split seconds are inherent in law enforcement. The existing ATF systems and quality of the people involved have in fact established a remarkable track record as it, result, as, as it pertains to the deployment of their special response team. What we have learned, there are a number of areas where we are deficient. The tragedy of Waco taught us painful but important lessons that will enable us to improve our ability to safely and effectively carry out our mission. That brings us, as I said before, every day, everything that we're doing in contact with the most violent and dangerous criminals in America. In order for these changes to truly make a difference, though, I am determined that we also needed to completely revamp the way we do business on a broader scale. I determined that we needed to improve our organizational structure and to establish a guiding vision that would give all of us uh, guidance to the action of our, uh, of our operations. I have completed the restructuring of our headquarters and am, now examine, and am now examining the field structure to see what adjustments are needed there. The successful future of ATF is dependent on a well-trained, professional workforce, and to this end, I have elevated the training function to an exec executive level by creating a training and professional development directorate. In a constant effort to do more with less, I have established a science and information technology directorate to ensure that ATF would keep abreast with all the changes in science and technology, and that will improve our effectiveness. I have also strengthened our internal review process to provide for a strong, well-staffed inspection and oversight unit to conduct both operational reviews and internal investigations. This unit reports directly to me. Additionally, I've established the Office of the Ombudsman to provide all levels of this bureau direct access to the Office of the Director. Eight peer groups have been put together representing a segment of our each segment of, a, of the diverse workforce within a ATF and have, have a, implemented the, to focus uh, on equal opportunity concerns. As I mentioned before uh, in other testimony, 49.1% of this bureau is minority. 
The personnel who oversee the EEO program within ATF have been placed in the director's office so that I may have personal daily oversight. The final and most important change that was needed, in my view, was to define the future of ATF. If we are to know where we're going, we have to know how to look for it. The outstanding work done by ATF has been lost over the months and years since Waco because of the Hagues of Waco, as well as the fact, as well as the fact that all ATF jurisdictions are highly controversial. For the outstanding work to be recognized of our personnel, it needs to be part of a defined mission, approved by the United States Congress and understandable to both the ATF personnel and the American public that we serve. Whether we believe it's fair or not, the fact remains that there has been a critical loss of public confidence in ATF. Our greatest challenge is to recapture, recapture public confidence by providing clear accountability for all of our activities. To accomplish this larger goal, I have instituted a strategic man management process that began with an analysis of the issues critical to ATF's functions. Attached to my statement is a written outline of ATF strategy for the future, and it's a document that looks like this. This strategic man management process is already beginning to radically alter the way we do business. These plans will define our future as an agency committed to ensuring a sound and safer America through innovation and partnerships. From the guiding principles to the basic operational strategy, this process will redefine ATF from top to bottom. Our new strategic plans will impact on every aspect of our work, from the type of employees we hire, how we train them, what they work on, and how they are expected to relate to the public that they serve. The basic enforcement strategy has already been defined in terms of what impact can we make on violent crime in this country. That's the priority. Laws and regulations will not be enforced or, or resources expended from this bureau in a vacuum, but as a carefully defined approach that will demonstrably con con contribute to the overall goal of the violent crime strategy for this bureau. The strong partnership and the spirit of cooperation we have long enjoyed with other regulated industries in the law enforcement community are being extended to the firearms industries and firearms owners. The strategic man management process also calls for measurable results in all areas to verify our success or demonstrate the need for additional changes. Since the strategic planning process will drive budget requests, this feature will also allow appropriators and others to verify that the programs they are funding are being carried out in the proper manner and are providing the benefits promised. While this hearing is an important process for publicly examining ATF's actions at Waco two and a half years ago. It is critical that we not overlook the substantial changes made at ATF since that raid. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of every man and woman in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms for allowing me to make this statement. Thank you very much. We're going to now begin a series of five-minute questions uh, into the five-minute rule. I'm going to take the first five minutes to myself. Mr. McGall, first of all, I want to say that whether or not uh, those of us up here agree always with the policies of ATF or whether or not there have been mistakes made, and certainly there have been by ATF agents and administrators from time to time, I think you should know and the men of ATF should know that we recognize that the vast majority of the almost 2,000 ATF agents every day perform dedicated service to this nation and that they act with great bravery on many occasions, and we're proud of them for that, and we understand their public service. Mr. Noble, I've got a couple of questions for you, and, and predicate to one of them, I'd like to point out to you that over the last few days, we've had several different pieces of information, quite a number disclosed, um, that were new to us, that we did not find, at least in the Treasury report, regarding what happened at Waco and the events leading up to it. Among those were Agent Aguilera's invitation by uh, David Koresh to visit the compound to examine the guns that occurred, uh, I guess, at McMahon's gun shop. 
Mrs. Sparks' warnings to ATF not to go forward, the fabrication of drug labs uh, by the ATF or apparent fabrication to get free unauthorized assistance, Director Higgins' lack of general supervision by Treasury, the Army Judge Advocate General who caught an illegal request by ATF before it was granted, fortunately, the failure of ATF agents leading the way in the raid to have warrants on their possession, and quite a number of other things that I could go on listing them. I just want to make sure that I'm correct. It is not your testimony today, is it, that these hearings have failed to disclose any new information that's not already in the Treasury report. I assume that you recognize we have disclosed things that are not in that report, that it is not total or comprehensive. You've said a number of things. It's a very complex set of... Um, well, I don't expect you to respond to every one of those, well, whether they're right or wrong. I mean, I just gave a summary of ideas. Well, you gave a summary of facts that I agree with, facts that I think are completely false. You've made a, a concluding statement that the report is not total and comprehensive, which I disagree with. Your general principle, I believe, is that hearings are important. I agree with that principle. Facts have come out. I agree with that. Critical facts, facts that make this report less than 100% accurate, facts that make this report less than comprehensive, I don't agree with. All I was asking is whether or not you thought there were facts that came out during <coughs> these hearings that were not included in the Treasury report. And you've answered the question, I believe, yes, there are facts, quite a number of them. Whether you or I would characterize them one way or the other is, is not what I was asking. I want to also ask you, did you uh, bring the Texas Rangers who are scheduled to testify tomorrow and before this uh, joint committee to Washington uh, before week before last or weekend before last at taxpayer expense? Did you meet with them? or have any of the Treasury officials meet with them over a period of approximately four days? And did you tell them uh, to focus their testimony? Again, there are at least four or five parts to the question. Uh, were the Texas Rangers asked to come to Washington in order to make certain that we were prepared and they were prepared? Yes, they were. Did the U.S. government pay for it? I believe it did and should have, since they were the ones who represented the U.S. government the murder trial and the other federal firearms violations and explosive violations uh, in Texas. Uh, and I find, if I remember correctly, I thought I saw Chairman Zeliff meet with the Texas, with, with, with um, some news reporter who was playing some video footage of the Texas Rangers, so I, I'm quite aware that you were aware of it. Did we tell them to focus their testimony? What did you coach them? The Texas Rangers? Well, did they come here at taxpayer expense, U.S. taxpayer expense? I, I won't even answer the question if I try to coax the Texas Rangers into giving anything other than forthright and honest testimony. I didn't ask you if you ask, coached them to give anything other than forthright testimony, Mr. Noble. I just asked you if you coached them, prepared them, or attempted to prepare them. That's all. If Ron Noble prepared them, the short answer is no. Did they meet with people on my staff with the intention of being prepared so that they could give you full and comprehensive testimony? Absolutely. Do I think that's appropriate? Absolutely. Mr. Noble, would you describe for us in the meetings that you had or the telephone conversations that you had uh, uh, joining Mr. Simpson uh, on the 24, 48 hours before the raid on the 28th of February uh, with Mr. Higgins, uh, the director of the ATF at the time, could you describe for us what transpired in terms of those things that Higgins told you uh, that were of concern to you, that caused you to advise Mr. Simpson not to go forward with the raid on the very first go-around? And then, if you could, what changed your mind that caused you? What did Higgins tell you? What new information came to light that caused you to advise Mr. Simpson to then decide to tell Higgins to go forward with the raid? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the first part of your question asserted that I, that I had talked to Mr. Higgins prior to uh, advising Mr. Simpson that the raid could proceed. If I could just go through the chronology to the best of my recollection, it, I, I if, would you, appreciate it. There's if you no don't mind. There's no confusion about it. We've heard Mr. Okay. Simpson testify. I'm not trying to do anything more than give okay. you the opportunity to Thank explain you. it. I appreciate that. I was advised mid-afternoon on the 26th, uh, Chris Kyler, who was the liaison from ATF for Maine Treasury, was waiting outside the office that I was then occupying, wearing a blazer and sort of nervously pacing around while I was trying to gather information relating to the World Trade Center bombing. Eventually, he entered my office and 
began to talk about this planned raid uh, near Waco, Texas on that weekend. And while he was uh, talking to me, I was thinking that this is something more appropriate for him to tell a person with line authority over ATF. So I suggested that he brief Mr. Langan and Mr. Simpson, the acting deputy assistant secretary and acting assistant secretary respectively. And he did brief them. Eventually, later in the afternoon, early evening, they all came down to my office and we reviewed this one-page advisory. And based on what I saw in that one-page advisory, it raised more questions than it answered about the safety uh, of the people both executing the warrants and inside the compound. And I just remembered my experience in Philadelphia when the move rate occurred and advised John Simpson that uh, he ought not to permit the, uh, the raid to go forward. At that point, there was a theoretical discussion for some time about what the jurisdictional posture was of the Office of Enforcement's role vis-a-vis -vis the one-page advisory. Was approval required? Was it being asked? If it wasn't required or wasn't being, being asked, couldn't we just say it's something that ATF ought to handle? And we eventually decided that we had to approach it as if in light of our positions, would a reasonable person occupying these positions be expected to act affirmatively, despite not being required to do so, to intercede in preventing something from going forward that ought not to go forward? And I took the position that we had to act, and that if I were he, that I would not let the raid go forward. And then what changed your mind? You've got to follow up and answer that question, I believe, with telling us what changed your mind. I was paged while at dinner uh, after having left the office and having believed that the raid would not go forward because uh, John Simpson, the acting assistant secretary, had called Steve Higgins and told Steve Higgins that he believed the raid ought not to proceed. When I called back the main treasury, or the number that was on my pager, I don't recall whom I called, but eventually John Simpson was on the phone, and he said that Steve Higgins was also on the line, and that Steve Higgins had additional information, which he wanted me to hear. And the information concerned the length of time that ATF had been planning this operation, the precautions that would be taken to make sure that ATF could tell whether or not Koresh would be alerted to the media stories, the series, the Sinful Messiah series that would be published the next day, that they were going to send an undercover agent in both Saturday and Sunday, and that that person would know whether or not something was amiss, and that they had this plan that they had planned for where at a certain hour, at a certain day, except the Sabbath, 10 o'clock in the morning, I believe, there would be men located one place, women and children located another place, and the weapons under lock and key in the arms room. That, that's the general discussion. And that based on those assurances, their training, that they had planned for it, they had an undercover agent in, I had no more reasons that I could articulate besides an emotional concern, or, or in or non-articulable sense of worry or anxiety. Uh, I had no reason to say, in light of this briefing and the assurances being given by the director of ATF, that his people had been told that if anything didn't look right, they were to call it off. They were going to send an under undercover agent in there for that reason. I could no longer say that there was an articulable reason or set of reasons why I would advise the acting assistant secretary to not permit a raid to proceed, that we were not required to approve the proceed in light of the assurances given. That's the best sense I have, sir. Ms. Thurman, you're recognized. Oh, Mr. Conyers, Mr. Conyers, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, because of that important line of question, uh, no objection was made about the number of minutes that the chair went over time, and uh, it's quite appropriate, except that he ought to note it like he does with all the rest of us. Uh, 
let him answer the question, and I would do the same for you. Well, that's, that's great. I'm glad I pointed it out. Uh, Mr. Mr. McGaw, uh, let's talk about the positive here, and, and I begin by commending both of you for a very, two very important statements. Uh, um, Under Secretary Noble, yours was uh, especially poignant, and I don't think it was lost upon anybody that heard it. Uh, it almost justifies the uh, huge number of hours, days, and time that we, we've spent in going over this matter. Mr. McGaw, let's talk about the changes that have been made as a result of the Waco raid experiences. Could you enumerate them uh, briefly? Let me start with the structural changes, because uh, I, I believe that in coming here and, and, and listening to the employees, looking at Waco, looking at their history, which I went back you know, into the 70s and looked at the history, I believe that virtually every mistake that was made at Waco is as a result of lack of training. Uh, when you look at each one of them, uh, you had commanders out there who had not been trained to carry, on, carry out their task. Uh, you had, um, you had uh, an undercover uh, operation that was, as you look back on it, remember now on all these answers, this is hindsight. Uh, many things I look at here I can say, but for the grace of God, there go I. Uh, so please remember that as I go along. But as you look at the undercover, um, their, their ability to transfer information, Agent Rodriguez doing a good job of bringing material out of there, but it not being transmitted properly. The automobiles were not the automobiles of students. Uh, their appearance was a little too old for students. Uh, we probably should have, if we're going to use those, uh, those, those people at that age, shorten their hair and change their upper positions a little bit. A number of those things. So, but almost everything you look at, it goes back to did they have training? And over the years, uh, ATF has budget has been cut many times because of the controversial jurisdictions. And this dedicated group has always, instead of instead of doing less out there or, or, or not enforcing the laws and taking the chances they do, they took their money out of training, they took it out of computers, and they took it out of a lot of sp office space and equipment. When you look at their office space and their equipment, it doesn't compare with any bureaus in the government their size, not near as, 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 as well done. At any rate, uh, so I wanted to make sure in the structure, where was training? Well, it was buried in management. So as a result, it didn't get an equal say. And also in our, in our black suit, uh, black agent suit, and in, in uh, some of the complaints that, that the agents would bring to me and the personnel throughout the Bureau, is that we don't have um, a, a training process by which we're trained every few years. So all of those kind of things were important to me. So the structure was a key thing. I wanted to make sure our technology was up to where it should be because they've taken money out of that in the years. And I also wanted to make sure our inspection and oversight. Now, in terms of, of uh, the other side of the issue is the operational parts of it. Well, first of all, um, I don't believe that a bureau of this size, I don't believe virtually any law enforcement bureau in this country by itself, individually, could take on an operation or should take on an operation like this again in the future. It needs the input of everyone. It needs the input of the public sector. It needs the input of the the people who know, you know, Rod, you saw Rodriguez this morning, how he feels and how he knew and how he had a feeling for how they would react. You need to, you need to confide in all the outside experts, the people who used to be in the organization. We, we didn't do a great deal of that. I believe that the loss of surprise was important, but I believe we would have, we would have changed our decision had our two supervisors been in the right place. The two primary supervisors who made the decision to go ahead, Sarabin and Hanowski, we're in the wrong place. You're not, you don't belong in a helicopter, and you don't belong on the raiding party. You have to be away from where the excitement is. You're not there putting your helmet on like the rest of the people, because once you start that, you're too close, you're too emotional, and they didn't hear what was being said Absolutely. to them. They didn't hear what was being said. Right. So, uh, well, I, wanna, I wanna congratulate you on that. I know that you have more, but let me just get to uh, Under Secretary Noble uh, very quickly. You, you weren't confirmed at the time 
uh, that the raid was planned, were you, Mr. Noble? No, sir. And let me commend you for another thing you did here this afternoon. You didn't come here looking to point the finger somewhere else. You didn't come here looking for cover. And it could, you could have easily faulted a previous administration in terms of the condition of that Office of Enforcement, and you haven't mentioned that one time. The policies and the procedures and the practices you had nothing to do with, and this tragedy has shaken all of us up, and certainly yourselves, and I think it's to your credit uh, that you're both here today testifying like you are. I would say, sir, that I had the great, greatest respect for the people who occupied my office prior to me, and I would say also that we benefit because despite whatever procedures they didn't have or policies they didn't have, for however many years that Steve Higgins certainly was the director of ATF, nothing like Waco had ever happened. No tragedy had happened. They'd done their job quite well. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. Mr. Zeloff, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Noble, um, Mr. Altman and you have something in common, I believe. Uh, you both had that gut feeling in your stomach that this thing wasn't right, didn't feel right, the Friday afternoon that you had a chance to review it. Um, I don't think Mr. Altman, I've never heard Mr. Altman. Well, he, he had a letter that went forth in the April 15th, and the only oh. thing I'm saying, the two of you must have this great ability that when you look at something, something gets described to you, and you see something that may be wrong, you uh, put up the red flags, you want more information. It's a compliment. And, I, ju and I just didn't know that uh, and, Mr. And Altman had any feelings like that prior to the raid on the 20th. Yeah, he, I'm sorry. he wrote in, on uh, Secretary Benson on April 15th that uh, he felt very bad about the thing moving forward. He felt that something tragedy, a tragic situation would develop, and he felt very bad about it and, and I think wanted someone to address it. You're talking about you had a chance. Are you talking about the, the raid on the 28th or something else? I'm now going back to you on that Friday before the raid on the no, 28th. No, sir, I'm sorry. I don't understand the premise. Okay. So are you talking about Roger Altman's I'm, I'm view on the 28th? You. I'm talking about you. Let, maybe I confused you a little bit. Let yeah, me just go I'm back sorry. to Friday afternoon where you were brought into this thing, and I was trying to compliment yes, you where you had that gut feeling uh, that things were not right, that you didn't feel that the raid ought to go forward. Am I right? That's correct, sir. Okay. And, um, and, and you specifically, you didn't feel that, we, why did we need such a uh, tremendous amount of force to execute the warrants? This is out of, out of the book on page uh, 178. What precautions were taken to ensure the safety of the agents? Why did ATF uh, uh, have to achieve its mission? Could they do it without a, without a shootout? Uh, these are really good concerns, and I think they were the kinds of things that you, before making your decision, uh, you wanted more information about. Am I correct? I did believe more information was needed, yes, sir. Right, and that all got taken care of in a phone call that you got at dinner. As I recall, sir, there was a phone call on Friday night, and during that phone call, Mr. Higgins was attempting to address the core concern, which was that the newspaper series that was going to be published on Saturday might alert Koresh to the investigation by ATF and cause him to change his pattern in some but, way. But May I finish, please? Okay. Therefore, Steve Higgins said that they had decided to send an undercover agent in on Saturday morning to determine whether or not there had been any change in Koresh's routine to determine whether or not he'd been alerted in any way by the published newspaper story. And that following that entry and exit, the undercover agent would report to his supervisors who would report to Washington. So who it, would, I, I, did, I, I don't want to use all my time. I only have five but minutes. It, you uh, asked me a question about whether or not I decided to let the raid go forward based on what was what told to me during a phone conversation on Friday night. And I'm trying to say, but that's not all that happened, that I got a call Saturday where Steve Higgins had talked to John Simpson and reported that the undercover agent had been in the compound on Saturday and had seen nothing to suggest that the 
newspaper story had alerted Crush in any other way. So, you, so make a long story short, you felt very comfortable now. You felt good about it, making that decision. I, I did that not you could feel move very comfortable about it. Concern about the use of force. I did not feel else. very comfortable, bu comfortable about it. I did not feel very good about it. I worry quite frequently when I know that my agents are executing search and arrest warrants. I rarely feel comfortable about it, sir. Okay, but I, I, I'm just concerned where you had all these good questions that later on none of them got really answered. I disagree with you, sir. Okay. Wh which the questions use, were The answered? use of force. Pardon me. The use of force. So much force. I think one of the first questions you had here: Why do we need so much force? to deliver these search warrants. And the reason for the number of agents involved was that the men were supposed to be in one location, the women and children were supposed to be in another location, and the arms were supposed to be under lock and key in another location. You, you indicate that, that uh, in your opening statement that the uh, military involvement was off the table. I don't know where you got that from. Uh, I just, as a point of information, I, I think that we're still talking about the military invo involvement. I, I thought I was talking about whether or not the mili use of military was illegal and whether or not the use of the military was based on false information. On the, the blue book that, that, you in, that you were responsible for, um, and, and you feel that, that since then and during all these hearings, um, in, in the opportunity and the passage of time, you think anything can be improved on, any new information has received? Absolutely. Anything at all that could be beneficial? Absolutely. I, I wonder how we will confront the next armed extremist group co-located with weapons and explosives and women and children in a barren area with a fortified compound willing to do anything and everything to keep law enforcement away. I still don't have the answer to that question. Mr. Nova, we, we heard from one of the defense attorneys, Mr. Tim Evans, that his client, Mr. Allison, was involved in the secondary shooting involving individuals who tried to sneak back into the Davidian compound. Mr. Evans described two affidavits filed by two different ATF agents, one of whom lied and said that Mr. Allison was shooting, and one of whom told the truth and said Mr. Allison's gun had not been shot. Mr. Noble, that story was not in the Treasury report, was it? I'm not familiar with that story, sir. I'd like to see the affidavits and the statements, and then certainly before this hearing is over, I can have someone behind me get to the bottom of it, but and I'm just not familiar with that. We learned that the Justice Department attorneys and the Deputy General Counsel tried to avoid creating exculpatory evidence by shutting down a shooting review and other interviews designed to get at the truth, and the Justice Star prosecutors uh, testified that such a practice was irregular and inappropriate. That story is not in the Treasury Review as well. I don't agree with the facts as you've asserted them. I worked at the Justice Department for some time. I respect the people in the Justice Department. I think it's a great institution. I think anyone who would characterize careful prosecutorial work as an attempt not to get or permit uh, Brady material or any other exculp exculpatory material to be given to the appropriate defense attorneys uh, doesn't understand the Justice Department. Thank you. I'm afraid my time's run out. Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Noble, just for the record, uh, you and Mr. McGaw, uh, what was your position on the day of the raid? I was a, a consultant for the Department of the Treasury. I had been named as someone who, following a background check, and following his nomination and hopeful confirmation would one day occupy the position of Assistant Secretary for Enforcement. You hadn't even been nominated? I had not been nominated. Thank you. Mr. McGall, what was your position on the day of the raid? A director of the United States Secret Service. Thank you. Mr. Noble, uh, prior to the entry, did you believe that the element of surprise had been lost based on what you knew at that time? What time precisely, sir? Prior to the raid going on. Prior to the raid going on, the most recent information I had was Saturday morning when the undercover agent came out. And at that point, I was told that things were as they had been historically. So I was not aware. Thank you. Uh, and just following up uh, on the facts that we've had come out of this hearing, uh, have any significant facts, uh, have you heard any significant new facts that would lead you to any different conclusions than what's in the book that was prepared almost two years ago? Absolutely not. Thank you. Um, do you have any different way of dealing with cults based on the, our experience? Yes. We have a different way in that 
everyone involved in federal law enforcement, certainly at, at Treasury, and I would let Director McGaugh to follow up. We don't have the answer. We don't have the answer in terms of how to deal with these groups, except to say that we have to recognize that they have to be dealt with very carefully. And as Director McGaugh has already stated, we know we can't do it alone as a department. It would not be wise to do it alone as a department. It would not be wise to do it without consulting the necessary experts in psychology, religion, or whatever the special interest might be. But I, I don't know if Director John McGaugh has anything to, to follow up on it. I guess the only, only thing that I would uh, say, Congressman, is that it's very important for the public and, and everybody here to know that, that, that we don't target cults, or we don't target religious groups, or we don't target militias. Uh, it's usually guns and explosives that bring us to those groups. Uh, and so when you're working guns and explosives, a lot of times it does bring you to them. Uh, but uh, obviously the things learned at Waco, um, what makes them tick? What is their logic? Uh, what are the concerns? And most of those groups are not only anti, um, you know, ATF or anti-law enforcement, they're anti-government all across the board. They don't want to pay state and local taxes. Uh, they don't want to pay federal taxes. They don't want to do anything that you and I normally do in carrying out our, our, uh, our obligations. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there, there has to be some work done, and, and Mr. Noble has started that, between justice and all their law enforcement, so that we do develop uh, better plans to, to work together. In uh, questions have been raised about the uh, warrant, let me first ask whether you have a different procedure in obtaining a warrant if it's a no-knock warrant versus a regular warrant. I don't believe there is a difference in procedure between a no-knock warrant and a regular warrant in federal law, as I understand it. I'm not authorized to practice law in this current position, but it's my understanding that the agents are supposed to make a de determination as to how to best serve the warrant based on the circumstances confronting them at the time. The um, questions have also been raised about the sufficiency of this warrant. We've had uh, introduced into uh, the record a, an analysis um, from a professor at the University of Chicago Law School that goes into great detail about the sufficiency of the warrant. Uh, his conclusion is it's not only uh, sufficient, but it's more than sufficient uh, so that uh, and my judgment, and I believe certainly his judgment, is the legality of the search and the arrest uh, is certainly beyond question. Uh, this weekend, uh, Senator Bradley on, um, I believe, Meet the Press, told the, um, described an incident where a second year law student at Harvard uh, was a guest of some of a, who was black, was a guest of a partner of his law firm he was interning with uh, in Los Angeles where he was attending a brunch at one of the partner's houses. Uh, he was traveling with a white female intern to the brunch and he was pulled over for no apparent reason, handcuffed and thrown to the ground. Uh, the exclusionary rule has been the traditional tool we have to protect us and tr to protect innocent people from the indignities of such arrest. Uh, we've had testimony from one of your officers earlier that he certainly has no problem obeying the law, but he is unaware of any sanctions for individuals for making an illegal arrest. Sanctions like prosecution for burglary, for being somewhere you're not supposed to be, or cuts in pay, cuts in pay or being fired. We've also heard from the, wit from the um, testimony from the attorney from one of the witnesses that this sole tool to, that protects innocent people is virtually worthless when you're dealing with a search with a warrant because of the 1984 Leon decisions. We, even if it were illegal, the evidence would be admit, admissible under the good faith exception, and then there's no point in questioning the warrant, and therefore no disincentive for making illegal searches. Mr. McGaugh, on page three of your testimony, you've indicated that law-abiding citizens have no reason to question the mission of the ATF. So my question is uh, whether or not there's any reason uh, that you can't confine yourself to only legal searches and let law-abiding citizens know that they'll be left alone because we have a strong exclusionary rule. I like the exclusionary uh, rule. Uh, I don't think we need to change it. 
I've used it for 34 years very successfully. If you make a mistake, uh, it won't allow you to do that. Uh, Miranda was set up years ago because, uh, and I can remember learning that as a young officer, because law enforcement officers did things they ought not to do. And uh, so while we're all out there trying to be the very best professionals we can, we need guidelines, we need restrictions, and so I'm not one to ask for that exclusionary rule change. I don't Thank think we need it. Time has expired, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Hyatt, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've heard from previous witnesses that nobody connected with this event made a written statement. That kind of surprised me because uh, I thought when shooting in, is involved and, and people are killed, uh, everybody who participated in it would file a report. That's the bane of law enforcement, uh, filing report, the paperwork. Is this unusual that nobody filed a written statement or made a written statement? What happened, Mr. Chairman, is that ATF began what was called a post-shooting review. And at the time they began the post-shooting review, two things happened. A U.S. attorney who was handling the murder investigation had turned over that investigation to the Texas Rangers. And there were reports in the press that ATF management was trying to prevent the truth from being told that ATF went forward with a raid knowing full well in advance that Koresh was expecting them. And for that reason, and the reason that the U.S. attorney was conducting a murder investigation through the Texas Rangers, what would have been an ordinary practice and a common practice did not occur. Well, in other words, winning the case became more important than really getting at the facts because uh, it was the Department of Justice. It doesn't say, it doesn't say uh, the Texas Rangers. Uh, it doesn't say the, it says the Department of Justice does not want Treasury to conduct any interviews or to have discussions with any of the participants who may be potential witnesses. The prosecutors don't want us to generate additional jinx Brady or Giglio material, in other words, exculpatory material that might prove one of these 11 who were locked up, one at least for a year, um, might help them prove they're innocent. So let's not discover anything, let's not take statements, even though it would be helpful in this comprehensive review of what happened and what went wrong, but for God's sake, we can't help uh, prove anybody's innocent. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. I'm not very proud of that, are you? Mr. Noble? If those were the facts, I would be not proud of it. But the facts are that the fact gathering was done by the Texas Rangers almost immediately after the event, a disinterested law enforcement agency. And the fact is that we avoided line agents continuing to feel as though ATF management was trying to get them to change the story about the truth of what happened near Wake on February 28, 1993. But, but you refuse to take statements from people who were involved. I should think that's the first thing. You'd want to know what happened. Let the chips fall where they may. But I the wouldn't want to have statements taken by people who are accused of trying to orchestrate a cover-up. Well, that is not the way well, to conduct an investigation. Send somebody else out that's to That's why the Texas Rangers conducted the fact-finding. Well, then, is it true or not, because this is a memo to you, uh, preliminary investigation plan from Robert M. McNamara, Assistant uh, GC Enforcement, dated 14 April 1993, DOJ does not want Treasury to conduct any interviews or have discussions with any of the participants. Now, how DOJ does not want us to make any findings or draw any conclusions from what we review. I mean, what, what e either you, you wanted to, to win the case and were willing to compromise truth, or you wanted to find out what happened. Do you want to know the document? Please, I'm sorry. Please. Um, do we have somebody who can take this to the witness? Congressman, while that's being done, uh, let me just mention to you that since I came to ATF, we created that inspection unit, that oversight unit, and now they do review every shooting. Every, the are there shooting reviews? Every when you were in the Secret Service, sir, did you require your yeah. agents to file, file a shooting review? 
That's right. And when inspection even, even if it might cost you winning a lawsuit. That's correct. That's the right way to do it. May I ask you, Mr. McGaw, have you instructed your, your people now uh, to leave the press at home next time they go on a raid? Well, we've, we uh, certainly have, have talked about the press, and we want to make sure that, uh, that if the press are going to be there, sometimes they find out about, other, about these circumstances uh, from, from other places. And so we want to make sure that if, if, if they are there uh, and are going to be there, that they're properly uh, handled in a safe spot and those kind of things. But as far as us advertising, trying to reach out to the press, uh, trying to give them early warning, none of that is to be done. Good. May Mr. Follow, Noble. Please. Yes, please. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I believe that there's a blurring of time frames that's occurring here. This memo is dated on 14th of April, 1993. Right. It's not talking about the fact gathering that occurred in early March of 1993 with regard to the post-shooting review. What it's talking about is the methodology that will be used for conducting the Treasury Department's independent review. So there are two separate issues that are going on here. This memo is talking forward in terms of how we were going to generate this document, but, not looking backwards but, in terms of how the Texas Rangers had already gathered information. That makes me feel even less comfortable because that says DOJ doesn't want you to take any statements, doesn't want you to reach any conclusion. I thought, I, I thought my government would want to find out what happened and who's at fault and who isn't. Instead, it's willing to keep people in the dark, especially if they're defense counsel, uh, uh, to, to win a lawsuit. That's yeah, what that English simply, means to me. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I, I think that is an unfair characterization of what was at issue here. You have two departments with separate and independent interests. One department is concerned about gathering information for purposes of preparing a cross prosecution, and another department is concerned about gathering information not to use in that prosecution, but for purposes of deal dealing with administrative matters. And all this memo said to me was that the Department of Justice wanted to make sure that one investigation didn't undermine the other investigation. Oh, that isn't what it and says. Is it says don't produce and don't, wit don't take any statements from witnesses. That's what it says. I'm telling you with all due respect that I worked at the Dar Department of Justice. I know the people who were at the Department of Justice. And one of the reasons why you don't want two statements taken from the same witness by two different individuals is because in court, just like, ha like is happening in this hearing, someone will take one statement and inadvertently or innocently read into it something that perhaps that author didn't intend. And that's why you don't want multiple statements generated in a case. Purely Mr. innocent reasons. Okay, sir. I know my time is up. I just want to make one very quick statement. It's very unusual that nobody connected with this debacle made a written statement. I think that classifies as a unique uh, event in the history Mr. of law. Mr. Taylor, you're recognized for five minutes. Sure. We won't run the clock till after the budget. Mr. Chairman, while we wait, has Mr. Noble seen that uh, before? I don't know whether he had or not. I presume it's the staff somebody had. Mr. Taylor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin with an observation. One of the people that I have the most respect for in this whole chamber is Henry Hyde. One of the guys I like the most in this whole chamber is Henry Hyde. But it does strike me a bit ironic that just last week my friend Henry Hyde voted not to subpoena the people who wrote the Sinful Messiah articles and left town for fear for their lives and is jumping Mr. Noble's case because they didn't seek witnesses. Sir, and I'll, I'll, I'll sign a subpoena for anybody in America you're you a good want. man. Thank you, sir. You just tell me who you want. <laughs> okay, well, that's not you, John. <laughs> okay, and if you can give me about five more votes, Mr. Hyde, we'll, we'll, we'll be you, well. Yours, need I'll to take be. under advisement. <laughs> well, when we get over this okay. hearing, let's okay. talk about okay. it. Okay, fine. sure. My okay. time's running. So, Mr. Noble, let's let's go back to the everything. Let's start at the beginning. Why was the ATF? I'm, and I'm going to give you a series of questions. Yes, because sir. I have limited time. Let's refresh the American people's memory why the ATF was there in the first place. When it was all said and done, was it found that after you had the raid, did David Koresh possess a large number of illegal firearms? I happen to own a semi-automatic weapon that Mr. Schumer calls an assault weapon. I don't think it is. He thinks it is, and I voted against his bill. 
Oh, so well, we're talking about real assault weapons here, real fully automatic weapons. I believe the conservative estimate by the FBI agent was 48 machine guns and multiple grenades. Third question is, it's been asked over and over, did your review show that any shots were fired from the three helicopters on loan from the Texas National Guard? Absolutely, unequivocally not. Nowhere along the line has Nowhere that been Nowhere along the line. Was Mr. Koresh being looked into because he happened to be a religious man or because there was talk of child abuse, because there was talk of illegal weapons, because there was talk of a hit list being compiled by him against former members who were talking to the police and to the press, because he was holding people against their will in the case of one woman for at least three months, or did the ATF literally throw a dart at the map of the United States of America and said, let's go find a country preacher somewhere to go harass? He was being investigated because he was believed to be amassing an arsenal of machine guns and grenades in violation of federal criminal law over which ATF has jurisdiction. Mr. Noble, in the review of all of this, because we've seen a lot of nitpicking out there, and uh, maybe that's how some people enjoy spending their time. Have you seen anything illegal? Have you seen anything immoral? And as a matter of fact, have you seen anything at all, and I'm going to open this to Mr. McCall as well, that would justify the death of four ATF agents, the wounding of 20 more, by David Koresh and his followers when they ambushed the ATF? Do you see anything at all that justifies the murder of those ATF agents or the shooting of those 20 others? Nothing that I could conceive of justifies David Koresh's ordering his followers to lie in wait with machine guns and hand grenades in order to murder and wound ATF agents. Mr. Nova, I'm going to ask one last question. And it is the question is now being turned around, should we have had these hearings? I'm personally glad we had the hearings. I, I think considering that we're spending a million dollars every two minutes on the interest on the national debt and the nation's got a hundred and fifty billion dollar a year trade deficit that there's certainly other big fish out there that we need to go after. But four good men did die. Twenty more good men were wounded. But hasn't it given the ATF an opportunity to talk about, in some instances, some things that need to be said? And also, in fairness to those four agents who died, don't you think it would make sense to subpoena the two reporters who left town after writing the series for fear for their lives? And then you, you had me nodding until you got me involved in the subpoena question. Okay. And don't you think and don't you think it'd be fair to have the woman who said she was held for three months yep. against her will, and the woman who, who says Koresh is compiling a hit list? I mean, my goodness, we're, we're talking about the deaths of four good people, one of whom volunteered to serve in Desert Storm. I, I respectfully would like to answer the first part of your question with regard to the importance of these hearings. I think they have been important because. They reflect that a department of this government and the executive branch, consisting of these brave and fine career law enforcement officials, can take an honest, hard look at itself and report back what is painful to many comprehensively and candidly. And I think that will help to restore confidence of the American people and those of us who occupy positions of trust. What you, all, what you have also done, sir, is that you have brought the attention of every law enforcement officer in this country, uh, however small or however large their departments are, to look at their procedures, look at their operations, look at how they're doing business uh, and how they're planning. Uh, and ATF is trying to be helpful with that, as painful as it is for us to, to um, share the uh, examples learned and the mistakes made. We are doing that at the requests of police department all over the country and most of you have seen and heard from Mr. Bu Buford, and he is doing a lot of that as he travels around the country. It's good for him therapy-wise, and it's very good for these departments, and we will continue to do that. Thank you, sir. Re reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, uh, although I was not sworn in like the other witnesses, the nice things I said about Henry Hyde, I really mean. <laughs> well, that's fair, that's fair enough. We don't have to say that under oath, Mr. Taylor. We believe you. Uh, at this time, I yield five minutes to Mr. Klinger. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to, for yielding my time, I just would like to comment that I think we're all here trying to establish 
uh, a record that will restore confidence in law enforcement in this country. But I would also say that I think one of the purposes is that we don't want to in any way uh, uh, downplay what went on. I mean, I don't think we want to, I wouldn't use the word cover up, but certainly the idea that we're tr if there's any effort here to try to obfuscate or make it appear that the mistakes were not as serious and as, uh, as uh, horrendous as they were, uh, would not be a, a good service to it. At this point, I'd like to yield uh, two and a half, two and a half of my time to the gentleman from New Hampshire and two and a half to the gentleman from, Mr. from Florida, Mr. McCollum. Mr. Novo, I believe there's a, a first attempt during the initial days after the raid by the Justice Department to elevate the criminal cases above getting at the truth and to cover up evidence that may have led to the innocence of particular individuals such as Mr. Evans's client. Now, isn't that true that during your review, you had to operate in a constant atmosphere created by the Justice Department and particularly by Mr. Webb Hubble that the Treasury re Review not produce any information that would hurt the all-important criminal cases? That is 100 percent false. There was no effort made by the Justice Department to cover anything up. Within days of the raid, the Texas Rangers had taken 85 written statements of ATF agents and others involved in the raid. As I said before, and I will continue to say, I have the utmost respect for those prosecutors at the Justice Department. I think they do a very, very important job, and they do it quite well. I'd like the clerk to pass out document mark number six, and I direct your attention to the last paragraph on the first page, and I quote, I'm raising this with you again today because at this morning's meeting with Justice, we heard that Webb Hubble, Associate Attorney General designee, is so concerned about the impact of our review on the criminal case that he planned to raise it directly with the President, unquote. Mr. Noble, I've already given you a, a major example of possible obstruction of justice in the conflicting affidavits by ATF agents related to prosecution of Mr. Allison. Is this the kind of thing that the Justice Department, and particularly Mr. Hubble, did not want covered in the Treasury review that might hurt the criminal cases? Absolutely not. The Treasury Department conducted over 500 interviews of people who have knowledge with regard to their, the occurrences near Waco and leading up to Waco on February 28th, 1993. There was no, no intention by anyone in the Justice Department or any other department to do anything other than make sure that we allow the criminal process to run its course in the criminal case and also let's make sure that the Treasury Department and the Justice Department don't collide as they conduct reviews with different objectives. What was, so you feel that's what Hubble was talking about? I served as Chief of Staff and Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division in the Justice Department uh, under President Bush. And I know that if I were in that position, I would have had the same concern as any prosecutor who was involved in overseeing prosecutions or investigations. I'll yield to the e, uh, Chairman. Mr. Well, I, I thank you very much on the remainder of Mr. Klinger's time and for his yielding. I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Noble, about a comment you made on the 60 Minutes program on May the 14th of this year, which you were asked about the Branch Davidians. And your answer uh, in describing them, you said, and I quote, this was not a religious group. This was a group of criminals engaged in serious violations of federal criminal laws. You did not mean by that answer to suggest that the many women and children who were part of that Branch Davidian group were criminals in violation of serious federal laws, did you? I meant exactly what I said, that though they might call it religion, there is no protection for any group that attempts or in fact does manufacture machine guns and grenades in this country well, in violation of federal criminal law. But did you mean that the children and the women were engaged in that manufacture? I don't believe I said the women and children, you but I will tell you, sir, may I finish? I will tell sure. you that we did uncover at least one woman uh, who used a firearm, and we have female agents who go out every day, so the fact that they're women doesn't mean that I don't believe that they pose a potential threat to law enforcement Well, I officers. don't think you would believe, nor do I believe, that Carrie Jewell was a threat. I don't think the children were, and my only point of making it isn't that there wasn't a problem there. There was, clearly. It is just that you made a very broad, sweeping statement that in my judgment over-encompassed the people in that compound, some of whom were very innocent of criminal violations. Let me ask you one last question. I would, I would Before simply today, say, Mr. Chairman, that that's what made David Koresh so dangerous, is that he would use children like Kerry Jewell or other children in order to protect himself from law enforcement officers executing lawful search and arrest warrants. Those are the most dangerous criminals. Well, they may, it may be that Mr. Koresh was a dangerous criminal. 
He and his but, followers. But the fact, the fact remains the that all the, women, all the women and children there were not dangerous criminals. And I'm sure you don't disagree with that when you reflect on it. Let me ask you one question left on the remaining time, though. Were you aware before today, uh, or I shouldn't say before today, before these hearings, of Mrs. Sparks, the Child Protective Service uh, representative who testified before us last week from down there in Waco, were you aware before these hearings that she had advised uh, against ATF, against the raid, that she had advised them uh, as she testified that David Koresh, in her judgment, should have been taken outside the compound rather than having an entry, that she was afraid that if he were uh, not taken outside that there would be a calamity, and if he were taken outside because of her long association with this, he would probably uh, be cut off and the group would not commit suicide because of, of the nature of the religious group, of the nature of their belief in him as a messiah, and the nature of the belief that uh, on the, the key day that was to arrive in Armageddon that they would all have to go up in flames together. Were you aware of that before these hearings? I believe the most, I believe I have it right, I believe that Joy Sparks was the person who reported that David Koresh had said on April 30th, I might have the date wrong, April 30th, 1992, in any event, the day following the L.A. riots, that when he revealed himself, the L.A. riots would pale in comparison. The detail that you went through just now, sir, I don't have a very clear recollection right now, but I'll think about it throughout this hearing. Th thank, thank you. you. It was just my point. I didn't think it was because it wasn't in the report. But in any event, Ms. Lofgren, would you, uh, ha you have five minutes. Chairman, let me give uh, 10 seconds to Mr. Scott, who has a quick question. Thank you. Mr. Noble, you were responding to the gentleman from Illinois about, um, in, uh, about getting involved in the investigation and mentioned specifically not developing Brady material. It looked like it was the first time you're seeing that. I'd like you to review that and get a little background on it and then report back to the committee of what your reaction is after you've had an opportunity to review it. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, um, I do have some questions, but I, there's been a lot of discussion and questioning about uh, religion and cults and uh, who broke the law and who didn't. And I think the, the First Amendment allows people to believe whatever they want, and that's important. It made this country great, but when those beliefs lead you to do things that violate the criminal law, then that's where there becomes a problem. And you can believe that it's good for 11-year-old girls to be raped. And that's not against the law to believe that. But when you rape those 11-year-olds, then it is. And I, I just think it's important to say that. And I would add further that any parent, and I would include mothers as well as fathers, who give up their 12-year-old daughters to become rape victims to their Messiah, uh, not only uh, has done something I think very wrong, but has also committed a crime. Having said that, I'm very interested, Mr. McGaw, um, about your recommendations on page nine of your testimony. There were a lot of things wrong uh, and, and some things right in this whole investigation. We had um, uh, Agent Aguilera and Rodriguez had developed lots of information. Um, but it's not clear to me that they, they were trained as police officers, and from what I can see of them, they were tough guys and took their work seriously and, and worked hard at it, but they weren't trained to really understand the cult nature of what they were dealing with, and they weren't investigating it because it was a cult, but because of the, the violations of the firearms laws. We had information dribbling in from the uh, Ms. Sparks, a CPS worker, former cult members who had left, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, DA's office, I guess, had information. You know, what I'm wondering is how are we going to organize ourselves t in the future to assimilate this information and be able to evaluate it with some expertise? I mean, people have mentioned that Ms. Sparks had the opinion that uh, if, if Koresh had been arrested off-site, that would have been the end of it. Uh, Agent Rodriguez reached a, con a, a contrary conclusion. I think both individuals cared about their job, 
worked hard, knew a lot, but neither one of them was really trained to sort through that. How are we de developing a structure so that that information can actually get to people who have access to expertise to evaluate it from a non-law enforcement point of view? Prior to um, the Waco investigation, ATF did not have a intelligence division or intelligence unit that reached out throughout the field. Now, when I talk intelligence, I don't mean intelligence like the CIA or, or the Secret Service would have in terms of trying to judge the risk of the president. What I'm talking about is operational intelligence. Uh, first of all, we should have identified that now we have uh, evidence that's working on a cult. So that intelligence unit now, <coughs> it's their responsibility to go out and find the experts in the field and to bring them forward to give us all the advice that we can. And uh, so now within each one of our divisions uh, is a, and a person who is responsible for operational and functional intelligence as it applies only to ATF functions. If we receive intelligence that involves another bureau, then we would pass it to Let them. Let me ask you another question along that, you know, just sort of reading through the report and listening these days of testimony, there were a state law violation, there was child abuse, of really, that reached the criminal, there was uh, rape going on within the compound, there was kidnapping, there was kidnapping across state lines of a child for the purpose of sexual abuse, there were arms violations, and there were at least some allegation of uh, 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 drug violations. Noting that you would have state violations, FBI jurisdiction, as well as ATF, how is there a way to do a, a, a collaborative to, to uh, would there require a change in federal law or for that matter state laws to do a team approach to go after all the violations? I know the focus of this whole thing for ATF was arms, which is proper and that's your jurisdiction, but it has occurred to me as, as I listened that we might have been better off had we had uh, the opportunity to have a consortium of law enforcement officials with various jurisdictions to go after the, the whole ball of wax. Do you, do you have an opinion on that? That's a very valid uh, idea. It's one that we work with uh, every day in terms of task forces. Whenever you see ATF function, it will almost never be alone. It will be with state and, and county and city police officers uh, working. And so that we do trade that information and we do keep it together. And many times when we arrest somebody on a gun violation, a lot of times it will go state court. It will go the, uh, the state system as opposed to federal. So we do, and that's one of the functions of this intelligence unit and the task forces to make sure all of that kind of information is not only coordinated on a local level, but wherever else it might apply throughout the country. We just finished a, a very large gun trafficking case which it took a lot of intelligence work. It came out of the south and went all the way across the country to California and north up to New York. So that kind of thing is really taking place now because, not that they didn't know to do it before, they just didn't have the vehicle to do it. Now they have the vehicle. And they also have the training and are getting more and more as we go along. Ms. Lofgren, your time has expired. I yield five minutes to Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Noble, um, Mr. Black testified today uh, that no one outside of ATF had been involved in the rehiring of uh, Sarabin and uh, Wanoski. Uh, the Legal Times has suggested uh, that you were involved to some extent in that decision. Um, were you involved in that rehiring decision? Uh, and if so, why? Uh, or were you not? And if not, why not? I was not involved in the Trying to, can I just answer? I don't know if I can do. I probably should answer that. Let me let me try tell you what my involvement was. Sure. I was I wanted to make sure that whatever happened to Mr. Hanowski and Mr. Serapin was within a range of discretion that I would accept from a bureau director. So, for example, if no action were taken against Mr. Hanowski and Serapin, I would think that that would be inappropriate. So I was kept in informed of what was going on. And I think for that reason, I would say I was involved. But in terms of the decision-making process, Director McGaw set up a decision-making process. Perhaps he should answer that. So you didn't make the decision, but you knew what was going on. You were aware of the... At, 
towards the end, at some point, at some point, sir, I became aware of what was going on. That's correct. Thank you. I believe Mr. Black this morning said that uh, that there wasn't anybody involved at that level. I, I'm I'm being generous in saying knowing is being involved. Maybe Mr. Black thinks I wasn't involved because I didn't interfere. Well, do you I mean, talk to you talk to other administration people about it? No. About the hiring? No, I talked to my staff about it. You talked to that's okay. You talked right. to your staff about the hiring. All right. Also, y you were directly involved in the decision to permit the raid to go forward. Is that correct? Again, I, I want to answer all these questions about my role as though if I were the Assistant Secretary for Enforcement, what I would have done. I don't want to nitpick about whether I was a consultant or not a consultant, but I gave advice that was followed that led to the raid going forward. That I accept responsibility for. Whether, I, whether it was de jure or de, de facto, I'm not drawing a distinction well, between we, that. You were notified of the plan. Uh, on February 26, which was two days prior to the raid, and basically uh, knew about it at that point. Is that right? That's 100 percent correct. Okay. And, and after concerns were expressed about the wisdom uh, of such a massive undertaking, uh, you and Mr. Simpson spoke with Mr. Higgins, and he told you that the raid would not go forward if things did not look right. Is that correct? After Mr. Simpson and others and I discussed the situation, reviewed the memo. Mr. Simpson called Mr. Higgins and told Mr. Higgins that he would not authorize the raid to proceed. Thereafter, as I tried to say earlier, Mr. Higgins called back with additional information on Friday and then again on Saturday, and a raid was permitted to proceed. That's correct, sir. Okay. Well, I guess this is my question. Given that you were one of the very few top people at the Treasury Department to have been involved in the process of signing off on the raid, wouldn't it have been better for someone who hadn't been as involved in the underlying controversy to conduct this particular report, somebody who would have been more independent than yourself? I believe the report speaks for itself. It is comprehensive. It is candid. It is thorough. It's been reviewed by three independent I, reviewers. I understand that, but I don't I finish, think please, sir? My you've, asked me, you've asked me a question, may I please finish? Three well, independent I, I didn't reviewers. Ask you that question. I, I, what I yes, ask you is, yes, don't you, did. you think you it would have been somebody? You said, wouldn't it have been better for someone other than me to have generated this report? And I'm explaining to you why it would not have been better. So your answer is no. My answer is that the independent reviewers, the inspector general, and others who have looked at this report say that it is a comprehensive, candid, and thorough account of what happened. And I have not heard anyone point to any part of this report other than the word 70 percent and say what is wrong and what is not accurate. Um, also, Mr. Noble, um, your report fails to cover one critical aspect of, of the disastrous decision to go forward with the raid, even though the element of surprise was known to be lost, and that's uh, who in Washington knew that the raid was suddenly being moved up in time. The report doesn't deal with that at all. Do you know if anybody in Washington knew that the report, time, that the report was being moved up the raid. I'm sorry, not the report, but the raid. From, May, from March 1st to February 28th? No, in time, from what was supposed to be 10 o'clock in the morning, and it got moved up once the element of surprise apparently had been lost. It's my understanding that no one was told at ATF, and I know no one was told at Maine Treasury, that Robert Rodriguez had come out of the compound and told various supervisors that Koresh knew ATF and, quote, the National Guard, unquote, were coming. So I'm not sure I understand your question, sir. Right, let me follow up with one final question because I'm almost out of time here. Your report has some very harsh words for some of the line commanders that were actually out in the field. Um, but it seems to have almost no criticism at all uh, for top Treasury officials <coughs> who allowed a very poorly planned raid to go forward on the basis of very little information. Uh, we've been told that the Secretary of the Treasury had never met the director of the ATF prior to the raid, uh, that those high up in Treasury who had doubts about the wisdom of the raid let it go forward without ever even asking to see a tactical raid plan, and that in fact there was no contingency planning. Isn't it true, notwithstanding your report, that some of the blame for the government's mistakes lies with Treasury officials and not just with the ATF folks that were involved? The Treasury report makes it very clear that responsibility for the raid lies with the Treasury Department, ATF, 
ATF senior managers, ATF raid commanders. The Treasury report makes it absolutely clear that if Treasury's directive had been followed, the raid would not have gone forward. So I would submit to you, sir, and anyone else who thinks about this honestly, that you ought to look at what the career Treasury officials did on February 26th, the day the World Trade Center bombing occurred. And I would say they acted properly and honorably, and I would just like someone to tell me what should have happened, what else should have happened, what else these two individuals could have done, but tell Steve Higgins they had concerns, stop the raid, then once their reason for concerns evaporated to let it go forward and trust that the raid commanders would know that a raid premised on surprise ought not to go forward once 45 minutes elapsed, That's sir. Thank you. Mr. Find out those, those answers to those questions Mr. to make sure this never happens again. Mr. Shabbat, your time has expired. We uh, now have a series of roll call votes in progress on the floor. We're going, I think there are four of them. We're going to take a recess until five minutes after the conclusion of the last of this series of votes. The subcommittees are in recess. This Joint House Subcommittee hearing on the Waco investigation will continue in just a moment. First, some program information. Tonight on C-SPAN, the Waco investigation, see day four of hearings held by the House Judiciary and Government Reform Subcommittees. Members are investigating the 1993 raid and standoff at the Branch 